if you make it important, they'll make it important, especially when you can connect it to how they are able to thrive in their role as a result of embodying those behaviors that connect to those core values. This episode is brought to you by my book, Speak From Within. Learn how you can engage, inspire, and motivate any audience. You can also download my four simple tips to make starting any conversation a breeze at the link in the show notes. Hello and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Whether you're writing the first sentence of a book or solving the climate crisis to get people's attention, you need to tell your story creatively. On the show, I interview peak performers who are coming up with those creative stories and solutions. Through creativity, compassion, and collaboration, they're changing the world. I also bring you ideas and techniques to unlock your potential to do the same. And now, let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I'm super excited to bring you this week's guest. Wait till you hear this. Dr. Dante Vaughn, DM, is the CEO and managing partner of CultureWorks. You know that's catnip to me because we're talking about company culture. This is a company that's dedicated to providing culture performance management solutions to help organizations measure, manage, and foster cultural change through real-time learning and practice. I'm dying to find out what real-time means. Dr. Vaughn is an expert in organizational leadership, workforce management, and company culture. He has over 17 experience of senior-level executive experience driving results in the public and private business sector, fostering the design and implementation of business growth and leadership strategies, and serving the companies throughout the U.S. and globally. Dante, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Isolde, thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to talk to you, actually, because, well, for many reasons, we were before we started recording, we talked about the fact that we have a lot of sort of similarities in in the work that we do with our clients. And I am very curious to get your take on so much of this. I know that you've written a book called From Culture to Culture, and this is the system to define, implement, measure, and improve your company culture with your business partner, which I think is amazing because company culture has radically changed over the last few years because of COVID and what they call the great resignation and other factors. I would love to hear your thoughts on that in a minute. But first, I'd love to ask you, what brought you to looking at company culture as your life's work? Where did that desire to help people work better together as a team emerge? Thank you for asking. You know, my interest in this journey of helping people lead better together started really during my adolescent years Mm -hmm. without me even recognizing that it would become more of a career for me. You know, I found myself, you know, I'm a native Philadelphian Mm -hmm. and, you know, growing up in the inner city and navigating different groups, different relationships and and trying to figure out where I fit into that and, and how do I uh, avoid finding myself in groups or paths that I shouldn't be, I really started to be hyper aware of group dynamics and how different people emerged within those groups, who showed up as a leader, who was more of a follower, because I always wanted to be more on the leadership side. And that was more of a natural gift of mine, but I was fascinated by how all these other groups function. Mm-hmm. Now, I never knew that that would lead to, or that there was even a career path. You know, I grew up uh, in, in the eighties where, you know, you, you were told that the best course of action was to be, uh, a medical doctor, an attorney, a politician, many mm-hmm. other things, uh, never had anyone tapped me on the shoulder and said, you would be more of like an organizational psychologist, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, not quite, but, um, and, and unfortunately the stigma is tied to, you know, young people, especially in the inner city. Oh, you're going to, you're going to do other things more athletic prowess. Right. But I was, I was on the academia side and, mm-hmm. and I, I navigated that world all the way through, um, my interest in business. But I, I realized I started out in the business admin world of things and, and more the transactional side of business and realized quickly that my passion was grounded in human experience, Mm. people connections. And that's where I started to study more of the business management side. And I 
I nurtured my career. I started out in retail operations and logistics and merchandising and kind of went down that path into other leadership roles that led me to more of a consultative role. And that's where I discovered, you know, the connection between systems, processes, and really the behavioral side of leadership and how do those things come together and how can you optimize performance? And that's where the my my experiences collided with my business partners, mm. Brent Power and, 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 and Sean Hart. Uh, they operated a, a independent consulting practice as I did. I had my own practice out of Philly. They had their practice in Georgia and, and they were significantly larger than me and was having great success. And their whole premise and their value proposition was to bridge the disconnect between systems, processes, and leadership behavior, and which mm. I found fascinating. They reached out to me as they were growing and said, hey, we have some work opportunity for your business. Would you like to, to partner up? And, and that's where our relationship started. And in that, in that discussion, we started to examine how do you optimize operational performance by addressing leadership behavior? Mm. And they had a vision around this that I was able to attach quickly to. And, and that's this premise of culture and what we now call culture performance management. And the value I brought at that point was more of the people science side. How do you bridge your understanding of behavioral change and organizational leadership and and, and what mobilizes uh, groups to be effective? And together, we develop this culture performance management methodology um, that is articulated in the book we wrote and, and published last year, from culture to culture. And, and that's where the real magic happens for us as it relates to behavioral change among leaders to drive an impact in uh, leadership culture. Wow. Ah, there was so much in what you just said. I, I love the notion of leadership behavior driving cultural change or changing leadership behavior. I have a strange question, which you probably get a lot actually is what are most leaders doing wrong in your opinion? You know, I, I don't know if it, it's if, if it's as much as if things are wrong versus for for many years, culture or the impact of leadership on culture has been this topic that's very much abstract in a lot of ways. You know, organizations have defined some core values or guiding principles that are supposed to be the framework by which leaders are supposed to engage and interact and, and make decisions in the business. However, those values often never leave the, the picture frames in the conference room, right? Mm. And, or on the website. How do you make those values actionable and drive accountability around how those leaders embody or practice those values every day? That's the premise of cultural performance management. And I think leaders haven't been e equipped with the tools and resources, and even the level of accountability around what that looks like. And, and it, it, because it's treated in a very abstract and arbitrary way, the leaders are going to do what they think makes them effective as a leader. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always align with the culture that you're trying to foster or perpetuate. So I like to look at it's a miss, if there's a miss in having an effective system to drive action around that. And, and I think that's the disconnect. And that's why we developed the cultural performance management system in the first place. That's so interesting because leaders don't know what they don't know in that situation and in, in what you're saying. And, and they haven't had any sort of a framework to really look at it from performance driven experience of their staff. And yet some there's a psychology at work there that I'd like to ask you about. Sure. A leader, to me, a leader is someone, like my job as a leader and I manage various groups, is really to support my people to do their best work. That's my view of what my job as a leader is, is how, what can I do to make sure that you have what you need in order to be able to do your best work? But that there's a confidence thing there. There's a, there's a psychology around a leader having the confidence to step out of what they know in order to learn and embrace something new. Now you've developed a methodology and I'm Im imagining that empirically you, you've tested it and you know that it works, but what happens to those leaders when they have resistance around it because they haven't had that as a even possible framework before? 
Sure, it's a great question. I mean, typically in most of our client organizations, they have not been held accountable to the level of specificity around an organization's core values, how to engage and interact with the standard in mind, how to connect that to where they show up and how they show up every day in the business and, and, and the results accordingly. Our, our methodology is grounded in once you have a value system, once you've been able to establish behavioral standards and expectations and connect those in a way that a leader understands how they can foster or perpetuate this culture, you have to afford them capacity to learn, practice, and refine those mm -hmm. behaviors over time. Behavioral change doesn't just happen with a switch, or a, a, a flip of a switch. Right. It happens with intentional practice of these behaviors because they don't always come natural or uh, to an individual. What what building trust may mean to you and how that is embodied may vary to how the organization believes they want to foster that trust building. So giving a leader capacity to, to say, listen, don't misconstrue a behavioral standard or expectation as a rigid way of defining leadership style. Mm -hmm. Your leadership style will be unique to you, mm -hmm. but your approach is going to be aligned with the culture that we're trying to drive or perpetuate in our organization. So to your point, it's okay if it's something that they're not familiar with. We believe it's about helping them understand what's in it for them and for the organization to be intentional about trying to practice these values in a way that drives an outcome or greater success for their team, for them, for the organization. And I think that's important in giving them the capacity to learn and practice and refine those behaviors over time, especially if it's less familiar to them. I love that you're trying to make the elbow room sort of to, to do that. And yet in companies, so many companies and organizations, there's a rigidity to to that kind of change, right? Oh, you're going to learn, but we're going to give you time to learn so that you can develop your own style of leadership and really work it with your team so that your team is successful. But there are, there's also the, the notion of, okay, we have the bottom line. We have these things that we're trying to achieve. We have, you know, third quarter earnings that we need to deal with. What, I guess to me, is it a top down thing? Do you have to go to the very, very top of the leadership to get their buy-in first? Or how do you, if you're working with middle management, for example, how do you, foster that possibility in the sense of possibility of change in people who have been doing things a certain way for a very long time? Sure. So to answer part of your question first is, yes, we have to work from the top down. Mm -hmm. If you have your senior most leaders misaligned to this value system that they believe is imperative to realizing their purpose, their vision, their mission, their objective as an organization, then we're already behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our upfront work is rooted in understanding and aligning the value system. Why is this important to you? And here's part of that effort, connecting that value system to their goals and strategies of their organization. And sometimes we have to work back backwards. There are leadership behaviors, skills, and competencies that you believe had, has contributed to your success. Let's talk about those. Let's also talk about those skills and competencies that you believe are lagging or lacking among your leadership group. And by identifying what those are and connecting those to the performance outcomes of the business, then we can say, well, what you're speaking to from a value system point of view are these core values, mm -hmm. core values of excellence, discipline, leadership, inclusion, whatever those core values are. So we kind of worked our way backwards to validate and connect importance because once a senior leadership team, all the way to the board, if we can get to the board, once they equate a performance outcome fiscally or, or, or otherwise to why these behaviors are important, it'll be hard to then argue reinforcement of these behaviors as non-value add. Mm. So we do that work upfront 
And then we make very direct correlations. We talk about in the context of productivity, efficiency, waste mitigation, reduction in turnover, reduction in attrition. Because from an operations point of view, we want to ensure that you understand and you connect with the value that these leadership behaviors have on your business. So we, that work starts at the top so then they can become sponsors, advocates, and accountability partners um, uh, as they work throughout the organization. You're going to hear a moment of silence periodically because I'm taking in the information and sort of synthesizing it. Uh, sure. So it's not a it's not dead air, as DJs call it. It's anticipatory <laughs> air. Uh, can you tell I was a DJ? So <laughs> what's interesting to me in in everything that you just said, this notion of getting by in all the way up to the board uh, of embracing this sort of change, I think it's I think it's in, incredibly crucial and the driver of that and, and correct me if i'm wrong seems to be that that employee engagement is so important now uh perhaps because of, because of covid perhaps because of the rise of the entrepreneur over the last 15 years what accounts for the need in your mind of leadership to sort of embrace these kinds of changes with respect to employee engagement you know, there are a number of factors that I speak to that validate the need to care about driving awareness, ownership, and accountability among your leaders. First and foremost, to your point, there's a market shift that has already begun and the demographic of the working population in the United States and abroad. Over 55% of the working population consists of millennial and younger generations. The factors that motivate them are no longer grounded solely in their income earning potential. Mm -hmm. You know, people want, of course, earn a living wage that they believe can help them prosper and thrive. That will never not be a consideration. However, you also have to consider that among the same population, over 60 percent of household income is earned in channels outside of standard wage and salary, which means they have other passive income earning mechanisms that didn't exist historically, mm. right? So now you have this gig economy where individuals can find channels of earning and it's still for them the flexibility that they desire. People want to be more purpose driven. They care about the value of how their time is spent. You take all those factors and you recognize that that is the future or if not the your existing workforce so you have to look at what becomes the reason or the rationale for them to want to spend their value added time within your institution because it's no longer dangling wage alone as the driving force. And then you couple that with their decision to remain with your organization longer than five years is rooted in personal experience, how they have been engaged and how they, they've left that engagement. So now you're going all the way back to what has your organization claimed to be the experience that a person can expect as an employee? Mm -hmm. And do you have credibility and validity behind what you claim? Or is that experience real? Because if it isn't over time, that's what's contributing to your high turnover and, and attrition within your organization. So, so now it comes down to, well, who fosters or perpetuates that experience? Your leaders. They own that responsibility. You know, I, I oftentimes get engaged in conversation and I'll ask the room, what do you think you're paying for when you bring an employee on? Well, I'm paying them to do a job. Well, that may be the output you expect, but what are you actually paying for? And they said, well, I'm, I'm to, to perform a duty. I said, no, you're not. What you're paying for is an individual's time. Mm. Now, you in a, as a leader are have validated that they have a certain set of skills and competencies that they can bring to you realizing your purpose, your vision, your mission. But it's up to you as a leader to draw that out of them or to optimize their performance potential. But what you're actually paying for is not the output. Now, maybe in a, a bonus program or performance bonus scenario, but in actual wage, you're paying for time. And then that employee is measuring, what am I getting for my time? That's why you get your lowest performing employees equally asking for wage increases among your highest employees. I said, if you're just paying for performance, 
then you'd be paying some employees one rate and some employees another based on performance. When in actuality, it's greater than that. That's it. And, and, and so then we have to ask ourselves, what are we fostering in that experience? That's why it matters. And that's just in the context of talent acquisition and, and optimizing performance potential. There's so many other factors when you have your suppliers and vendors now challenging you. I've, I've had clients calling me saying, my, my largest client is now conducting a culture audit on my business. And they want to validate that what I claim I'm doing as an institution is actually happening. So this, this culture performance management system becomes imperative to the marketplace, both as the consumer, as the prospective uh, uh, talent holder, and even for your customers. So fascinating. I am, I'm curious about something because it is, it sounds, Honestly, it sounds huge, right? It, when you're when you're talking about it in this way, it's both gigantic and in some ways minuscule because there's so much to pay attention to. And the great Tom Peters was on the show. He's been on the show a couple of times, but he was talking about something that he that that's one of his favorite ways to describe leadership. He says it's leadership through wandering around in that the leaders, the managers of organizations best find out what's actually happening what's you know boots on the ground by wandering around the organization by knowing the people who are working with them and for them and it sounds to me like you're pretty well aligned with that but the question i have is how how do we change these things and i know you outline a methodology in, from culture to culture but how do we get this kind of really in many ways radical change to happen day to day you know, and I, I'm, I'm familiar with Tom Peters as well, right? And, and he's he's the extreme humanism guy, I think. Yes, he is. <laughs> um, I, I, I get it. And he's right in the context of the importance or the impact of human connection. At the end of the day, we define culture as the values we share, the language we use, the behaviors we display, the connections we make values, behaviors, language, and connection. That's what makes up culture in the broad context as well as organizational. So when you think about it in that context, how do we begin to mobilize and align leaders around this leadership culture we're trying to foster? Again, not misconstruing leadership culture with leadership style. Leadership culture then is required to first, let's get alignment on our core values. Let's in our beliefs, what should be our guiding principles that help us approach our engagement, our interaction, and even our decision making when all else fails, when we don't have a standard operating procedure or some kind of process map, what's going to help us inform our engagement and our decision making practices? Our core values and our beliefs become the framework for that. Okay, so values we share as a collective. That means as you attract a, a new talent, clarifying all the way from your job description and looking for other points of integration, even down to your interview protocols, you should ensure that you validate that this candidate has the propensity to understand and connect with these values, even if they need help learning and practicing. That's why you need these mechanisms for learning and practice. I'll get to that. But generally, you need to align the values we share. The language we use, how do I manifest these values in real time? So you have to be really intentional about this, this establishing standards. That mm -hmm. means revisiting your value definitions, not in these abstract, oh, we we bleed red and, <laughs> and we show, you know, these, our, these abstract terms and phrases. What does that mean for me and how I show up? And I need that clarity at the C-suite level, the V-suite, all the way down to the frontline operator. It mm -hmm. means to show up in this way. Here's some examples, really good methodical. And we work with our clients to get very specific and methodical about these actionable behaviors that connect to your core values. So now these are the, the behaviors we display, the language we use. They're shaped by these definitions and standards that you're putting in place. Now, the connections we make, think about it. Organizations have core values, but being intentional about practicing them in real time, and this will get into your other question about what do you mean real time? Every point of engagement or interaction and, or decision-making 
that a leader experiences is an opportunity to either promote or detract from the workplace culture that you're striving for. Mm -hmm. Every single point of connection. Mapping out those points of connection, at least the most critical ones, from the time that you have your startup huddle to your operations meeting, to your safety uh, meeting, to your floor walkthroughs every two hours. Those are opportunities to foster that culture. For example, if one of your core values is excellence and one of the behaviors associated with ex excellence is personal discipline, then the subtleties in, okay, you told your team that you're going to huddle at a certain time every day, then ensuring that you make that time. And if you don't remain disciplined or diligent in that in, enough to proactively inform them that you're not going to meet when you said you're going to meet because you're trying to perpetuate excellence and the subtleties of that. Well, that's hard for a leader to recall or remember. So having mechanisms in place in your business to trigger this connection to when you're trying to be intentional about practicing the behaviors that connect to your core values becomes very essential. So now I'm going from this abstract, arbitrary thing to define standards and expectations for, for the embodiment of these core values, all the way to proactive and intentional practice of these values. Now, I made these connections. How do I learn what it means to show up? I just threw one arbitrary behavior out connected to the value. Oftentimes, there are multiple behaviors connected to the embodiment of a value which leads to this leadership culture. How do we equip our leaders with tools and resources to learn and practice these behaviors in real time, meaning at the point of connection, where culture happens, not after the fact, not after I surveyed my staff once a quarter and tried to generalize their, per their perceptions and then mobilize my leaders around making change. That doesn't get us to root cause. What gets us to it is, is, is how do I go to real time? The greatest impact a coach has is when he's able or she's able or, or, or they are able to engage that player in the midst of the game. Say, hey, correct your stance, adjust your position, adjust your swing. Don't forget about these principles. Don't forget about these best practices. And then that player can go out and make those adjustments. So we apply a similar approach in culture performance management and some of the tools we build is to give them the morsels of insight and information give them an opportunity for self-reflection and for feedback. Now we're getting into real behavioral change. And then they have an opportunity to course correct in real time. They're not waiting for an employee to then give them feedback three months from now after they've decided to leave an organization before they have a chance to improve how they're showing up, how they're engaging, how they're in, uh, interacting. That's getting at Tom Peters' point of view around humanism. How do you humanize that connection in a way, uh, but do it with intentionality? So we we align with that premise, but we we believe that behavioral changes occur through self-reflection, feedback, and an opportunity to course correct over, uh, in real time. So that's what we mean by that premise as well. Yeah, I think that's exactly, I, and I love that you said that course correction is a part of it because it's not necessarily going to be a 180 degree change. It's going to be yeah. something that you are modifying as you go. And yeah. it seems to me that there's a a real factor of personal accountability. And that, that means not just on the leader's uh, sort of place, but also the, the people who are their team. Everyone has to have a certain level of personal accountability and a desire to strive for that excellence. And the question that I have for you is how do you instill that if it's just not there? Yeah, great, great question. You know, what I find, you know, imperative as part of this culture journey for organizations. Communication and integration. Communication, not this, just in the surface level kind of marketized way. Communication in terms of this is what enables us to exist as an organization in terms of how we show up, how we engage and interact. Commitments that we can make around that at all levels of the organization and how it manifests and how you show up and in and, and the value contribution you make. So I think communication and, and navigating that through a deeper lens it becomes imperative all the way to the front line. Once people start to connect what's important and and there's some evaluation and measurement around it, you're going to be more inclined to start to want to act upon it. And I and there's a saying in the book. 
that we reference, you you promote what you permit. At the end of the mm. day, if this culture is imperative to your success and realizing your purpose for existing as an institution, then it is equally imperative for you to drive accountability when you see individuals at any level of the organization failing to embody those core values. So if you make it important, they'll make it important, especially when you can connect it to how they are able to thrive in their role as a result of embodying those behaviors that connect to those core values. So I think that's important. Now, the integration piece is you make it a part of people's existence from the time that they walk in. We call that sort of the culture path. You know, how do you make it such an important nuance to how everyone operates from your communication centers throughout your organization to your agent meeting agendas? Are there moments to reflect on how this culture is being realized and lived every day? And then there's methodology to this, as you referenced earlier. We believe and we apply principles of social learning theory and experiential learning theory. Experiential learning theory ties to behavioral change process. Social learning theory ties to how do you start to see these behaviors perpetuated at multiple levels of an organization? Once I get a sense on how I can expect you to engage and interact with me and what that standard or that expectation is, I start to adopt or adapt to those behaviors. And that's how culture or multi uh, multicultures are adapted. If I don't align with those exchanges or the approach in that exchange, I start to stand out. Then the question becomes, does, is this a culture fit or not? Mm. And sometimes it isn't. So you're going to have, I always say, look, if you're going to really drive this forward, you're going to find that there's, there's about 10 or 15% of your organization who simply doesn't fit the culture you're trying to drive for. So then you have to ask, ask yourself, how important is this culture to you? And you may have to have some hard conversations with folks because they don't align and possibly could even be holding your organization back. Now, those those are some tough conversations for sure. And yet at the same time, you know, with your idea of course correction, it seems to me that there would be the opportunity for that person, that staff member to course correct themselves, right? If they're not aligned with the mission, is there, and if so, what is it, uh, a process to help them course correct within that framework? Yes, I mean, our, you know, when we have, we have a seven pillar framework, the first three pillars are about fostering alignment, awareness, consciousness, or what we call cultural consciousness. But now we have to actually learn, practice, measure, and refine how you show up and, and practice these behaviors. Mm -hmm. And that's pillars four through seven. That's the, the crux of the behavioral change process. Mm -hmm. Let me provide you, now we adapt the microburst learning approach that says, look, you know, classroom training, there's a time and a place, and we will support that to some extent and try to make it as active of a learning experience as possible. But from an experiential learning standpoint, we believe in a real-time approach. So we believe in providing mechanisms for reinforcement of behavioral standards and principles in real time. We like microburst learning opportunities where it's, it's very actionable. Hey, you're practicing trust today. Part of being trust or trustworthy as a leader is to be, for example, one behavior is transparency. Here are some tips on how to be more transparent as a leader as deemed appropriate for the level that you're engaging with in your organization. Here's some quick tips that you can apply. Not next week, not next year. You have a meeting in 20 minutes. Mm. Let's, let's look at that in the context of how you're going to be intentional about practicing transparency in the upcoming meeting. Right. And then after that meeting, I want you to self-reflect. How well do you think you practice these core competencies or behaviors that we reflected on being a transparent leader? And by the way, we invited someone to that connection to observe you and give you feedback. Could be your direct reporting manager, supervisor. It could be just an accountability partner in your organization. For some, they may even want their employees to do it. Now, we uh, always encourage allow the leadership to hold one another accountable and learn what it means to show up that way. And through social learning, your employees will follow. But nonetheless, you have a channel of self-reflection. You have a channel of feedback. And now you have an opportunity based on that self-reflection and feedback to digest that micro-learning, microburst learning, or those principles differently. 
And then guess what? You get another swing at the bat on the field in real time. That's how we foster that intentional, let me try to practice what it means to show up at, in, in, as a leader that way. And we recognize this is not an easy feat to put these systems. That's why we build the tools and we leverage technology and other mechanisms to say, hey, here's the methodology. Here's how to do it the right way to drive behavioral change. All other ways will have a lagging impact or not as significant. It's sort of like the value of uh, uh, Isolde, us as consultants sitting on the shoulder of our leaders as we're coaching them in real time. What happens when we go away, right? That further reinforcement and adoption, where's that, that piece of the puzzle? So we're trying to bridge that disconnect. Once we go away, how do you ensure you have the tools to drive that behavioral change and accountability over time? This episode is brought this to you by my book, to you from by within. my workshop. Learn how you can in engage, harmony, inspire, and motivate and any audience. You music. can also download Learn my how four you simple and tips to make starting any conversation a breeze at the at link in the show notes. Com slash so w -I, I keep saying it's, it's fascinating or it's interesting because it is. And it's what I'm hearing actually sounds a little bit like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Sure. It's it's very similar in, in that, except for that the therapist is, you know, sort of it's self therapy. And what we're asking for in this in this framework, I think, from leaders is to is to have that awareness, to be able to do that assessment, to be able to contemplate all of the changes that they're trying to make and then assess either for themselves or with an accountability partner how they're doing on those changes. And that takes uh, this is going to I'm not I'm not being judgy at all, but it sounds like it takes somebody who's either pretty well adjusted or who's on the path to becoming pretty well adjusted. And that brings me to mental health. What is your thought about this this style of leadership and this methodology of sort of building better leaders and mental health in, in leadership and also in the companies or organizations themselves? Yeah, I mean, to that extent, when I think about mental wellness in the workplace, you know, a lot of our upfront work consists of identifying where there are breakdowns in communication, in how the dynamics of the senior most leaders have fostered psychological safety mm. in a manner that equips the leaders to want to work through the behavioral change process. When you think about cognitive behavioral therapy in, 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 in your context, right? That's the type of therapy that helps individuals identify and change their thoughts and behaviors that are contributing to their efficacy or inefficacy as a leader. And for them to be able to be in that space of interest and desire and want to change means that their senior most leaders have established room for them to do so. It, mm -hmm. it, the average leader or individual in general does not show up and want to fail. They want to thrive sure. and succeed. Mm -hmm. The idea is how has the organization created psychological safety and provided tools and resources that fosters their ability to seek the help they need, both in their leadership development and sometimes in their psychological or emotional intelligence development. So some of our upfront work is to identify, have you created a safe space for your leaders to do so? And if you have toxicities that are underpinning your ability to really see this through, let's address those. So we do a lot of that organizational psychology work in tandem with the behavioral change process, because that is necessary. And we do see barriers that we need to address. We call them those elephants in the room. And a lot of times there's significant emergence. And we believe that our, our purpose in helping people lead better together translates to their personal lives as much as it does their professional lives. There's not a switch you turn off as a leader when you go home. So we really try to address those barriers in a, in a sincere and authentic way in order to realize the full potential of what that looks like, at least at the senior most level. Because once they've done the work, 
they become a catalyst to change among their frontline leaders as well. And that makes a lot of sense. Some of this is going to be a, sort of a a full body, full mind change if you're if you're looking at it from that perspective. So there's self talk involved. There's also communication involved, and as a leader. I, this is a strange question, but do do have you ever had anybody become too aware, maybe hyper vigilant in in this situation, or do do people seem to even out and and the workforce culture becomes sort of uh, more well adjusted as a whole? I, I generally see it in you know as a holistic impact right over time, right. Mm-hmm. What I find on an individualized level is there's a sense of personal and professional development that's happening. I see that this intentionality around shifting behavior starts to manifest in their personal lives, sometimes before it ever manifests in the workplace. Hmm. Just the intentionality around trying to navigate how they show up, how they engage, how they interact. I've had clients come to me and say, hey, just so you know, my wife or my husband or partner is enamored by the work that we're doing. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, why? Tell, please explain. And that's awesome. Well, I'm being a little more conference conscious about this behavior. And I realize I don't, I do the same thing at home with my kids and mm-hmm. I'm inclined to just cut them off or I'm inclined to just throw a solution out when all they wanted to do is um, have an active listening ear and some empathy. Right. I mean, so I see it manifest in different ways. Uh, for the individual. And but this change readiness is going to vary. You know, some organizations we go into, and this is why we approach it with some latitude or flexibility. Some organizations say, hey, I'm all the way at pillar one. I don't even have a value system. Just help me get a value system in place. Help me be clarified the alignment of my purpose, vision, and mission. Help me set, set some basic behavioral standards and expectations. Okay, so you want us to help you with pillar one and pillar two, maybe a little bit of pillar three. Okay, great. Well, then what you're looking for is just some inspiration around driving toward this leadership culture. For others, they want a bit more of a innovative approach to driving leadership development. Okay, so you want to get into more of pillars one through four, all the way to that learning process for your leaders give them a path of, of, of development and even succession. Okay, great. So then you want culture innovation. And then you have some who are at a point of either, either need or readiness or both to drive true transformation. And that's where we're getting into really getting at the toxicities, the barriers, the mental wellness piece. That is more of a transformative approach. And not every organization is ready for that or wants that. So we try to say, I'm going to meet you where you are and let's navigate this process because we recognize it is it, it, it can be a significant lift. But that's why we build the tools and resources that we have so that you don't have to bear all of that burden alone. That makes a lot of sense to me. And and yet again, this is and I know you work with leadership, so I get that. It's just it seems to me that when we're looking at organizational change, it's not just the leadership you need buy-in from, you need the the sort of the staff people, the employees to also buy in. And the question I have for you is that there are some who advocate for a more sort of consensus oriented organizational style. How does that align with what you do when you're working with leadership and making these pillars become part of their organization? We believe the minute an organization prescribed the core values that guide their organization, you've already professed to the marketplace that this is how you operate. Your employees at large do not get to define how you think, the, what you, what they believe they want the culture to be. Mm-hmm. You as the senior most leaders and visionaries and drivers of the business, owe your staff, owe your employees guidance around, here's the culture we work to foster as leaders and why it's important to realizing our purpose as an institution, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So it's the responsibility of the individuals who prescribe the culture to begin with to say, hey, here's what this looks like. And we're going to invest in with intentionality how we drive toward realizing that experience. So we believe in our methodology that you as a leader own that, not the employees. They don't get to 
drive that culture for you. They get to contribute. They get to learn from it. They get to, to expound on it in, in the context of experience. But at the end of the day, what grounds you is those core values and beliefs that drive engagement, interaction, and decision-making in the business. That's mm -hmm. like having your employees say, well, you know what? Again, look at it through a strategic pillar lens. Would you ever let your employees alone declare why you exist, how you exist, and 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 all of the investments you're going to make to realize uh, your existence? Like, no, you're going to have a foundation and then leverage employees from an innovation point of view. But that that initial responsibility rests with senior leaders. So that leads me to before we before we finish up fully, that leads me to my last question about this. And that is what in your mind does a successful workforce culture look like? That's a great question, right? I don't have any ideological view on the core values that you uh, believe are important for your organization to that, I guess, shape your culture. What mm -hmm. I can say is a successful workplace culture is one where everyone is aligned with the core values and beliefs that shape how they show up and operate every day how they come together collectively to engage, interact, and drive outcomes as a business. You need a level of alignment and in and, and broad context. The consensus understands and aligns with the culture and celebrates it because they recognize how that impacts their lives and the lives of others. That's part of that, that, that healthy workplace culture. A healthy workplace culture is one where when there is misalignment to how individuals are behaving and interacting, that there's accountability at every level. The minute someone uh, does not um, practice and with some intentionality, those behaviors that align with this culture that has led to everyone's success, as someone's inclined to say, hey, friend, how you're behaving doesn't align with the culture here or our core values. And let's figure out why, and let's give you tools and resources to course correct. That's a healthy culture. A healthy culture recognizes that their objective is not grounded in trying to keep people happy every day. Happiness is an emotion that can ebb and flow. But the emphasis around people moving with intentionality, mm. feeling purpose-driven, feeling valued, and, doing, and, and experiencing these things by way of this culture system that you've developed, that's a healthy culture. So even in the midst of turmoil, you can ensure that your organization is going to be okay because we're grounded by these values and these beliefs. We hold each other accountable around those things because we believe in our purpose. We believe in our vision. We believe in the mission that we're all on to realize that purpose. That's a healthy culture. I could go on, but, but those would be three paramount pillars. And that's why we built our system to say, hey, we recognize it's not easy. Let's give you some a pathway to realizing sustainability of a healthy culture. And, and it's not reactionarily realized through just, you know, the results of an employee engagement survey. Yeah, I, I absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And because th those those surveys are, unless there is authenticity around feeling like you can speak and be heard and that there will be some accountability around that, th those those surveys become almost meaningless. So I completely understand. Dante, I am so grateful that you took the time to join me on the show today. I really, this is so, so, it's so fascinating and enlightening. And again, we align so much about what we're around what we do that it's, uh, that it's just a delight to get a chance to get your, to get your thoughts and your viewpoints. Uh, if people, want to know more about what you're doing, what are the best ways to find you? So I encourage everyone to visit our website. It's www.getcultureworks. That's culture works with an X as in xylophone. C-U-L-T-U-R-E-W-O-R-X. Getcultureworks.com. So you can 
read more about this premise of culture performance management. You can see a number of blogs and, and videos. And of course, you can contact us right through our website. You could also visit us on any major social platform. You can look for Dr. Dante Vaughn uh, or for Culture Works on LinkedIn, on Facebook, even on Twitter. So you have an opportunity to, to connect with us there. Uh, we're even building out our repository of just various um, webinars and speaking engagements that I've taken part in to continue to get these insights around how to define, implement, measure, and improve, improve your workplace culture in, in a real and intentional and proactive way. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that. It, it, all of that will be in the show notes, but I know people learn differently, so I like to have have it on audio as well as the visuals in the show notes. I have one last question for you before we sign off. And it is a silly question, but I find that it yields some profound answers. And the question is this, if you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Oh man, if I had an airplane, I could skywrite something for the entire world to see. Mm -hmm. I would say, am I, do I have a word limit? No, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess we could have a plane with one of those banners, you know, oh, behind cool. it or something. Cool. You know, they charge by the letter. I know. know they do. <laughs> um, so I would say. so many things I would say, but I was first banner, I would say <laughs> love is the answer. That's fabulous. Love of self, love of one another. If we could start there, whatever grounds us into what how we define love. For me, I believe God is love. But I I I and I believe that that's where a lot of our pain and our anguish as, as, as individuals and as a collective is grounded in a lack of self-love and a lack of love, authentic love for, for one another and however mm -hmm. that looks or manifests in our lives. So I would start with that banner. That makes all the sense in the world to me. I love it. Dante, thank you so much again for joining me. We'll be back for the bonus episode in just a minute. But in the meantime, you need to go find Dr. Dante Vaughn and Culture Works. Find out what they're doing. If you're a leader or if you're being placed into a leadership role, if you're just at the beginning of your leadership journey, it seems to me like this is a really great platform to start with, to actually get on the ground floor with so that as you build yourself as a leader, as you create yourself as a leader, you get to do it from this place of accountability, purpose, and also communication. So this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Solutions Podcast, reminding you as always to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. <music>Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in. Thank you.